people were upset about the economy, people were upset about the foreclosure crisis, people were upset about the bailouts, uh, and about the fact that it looked like elected officials were working for big business rather than for the people who they're supposed to be working for. The economic, political, and social conditions continue to deteriorate. And there are people that need to be held accountable, and there are systems in place that are f***ing us up. But I think that the thing that joins people is understanding that this system is not working. Looks like it's going down. All person, but temporarily leave the park. At 1 a.m. on November the 15th, 2011, New York police officers in riot gear surrounded a tiny section of Lower Manhattan. Until I was actually in it, I didn't realize what a sort of like war zone they'd created that place to be. And it was one of those moments where I was like, what is going on? <laughs> Zuccotti Park had grabbed the world's attention as a symbolic hub of Occupy Wall Street, a people's movement that had set off a chain of rage against the country's political and financial elite. But after 60 days of protesters defiantly occupying land in the heart of the world's financial capital, authorities cracked down. Let's go. Relax, 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 relax. And the fact that you want to do it at night and you want to, you want to block people out from seeing that demonstrates that the level of unnecessary violence that you were going to use and that you're not comfortable with the public seeing that. And that's a, that's a real problem. I mean, you saw people lose their homes. Um, and uh, lose their family and have their community uh, attacked. And, and that was, that was painful. Um, it also felt like there was war. In just two months, Occupy Wall Street had transformed the public discourse in America, challenging people to not only demand change, but to live it. This is the story of Occupy Wall Street, told by the people who have lived it. Months before tents went up in Zuccotti Park, there was a movement already brewing in the streets of New York City. There was a group of um, activists representing people from all over the world. We had someone from Japan, we had someone who had just been back from Tunisia, I'm giving report backs on what was going on in uh, social movements in different places. Longtime activists in New York and others from Greece, Spain and Egypt came together to talk about building an inclusive democratic movement based on models of Tahrir Square and Madrid. Weekly meetings began to take place to discuss how that model could translate to a US population. But it wasn't just happening in New York. Across the country, grassroots organizations were seeing signs that America was approaching its own peak of political discontent. So in the spring of 2011, at least with Take Back Land, we met, we talked about, we said, you know, what well, something different is happening right now. Something, something feels different. Something is different. We're, we feel like we're about to reach some kind of critical mass of organizations who want to do something that they were not willing to do a year ago. Around the same time, a Canadian magazine, Adbusters, put out a call to occupy Wall Street on September the 17th. It reverberated across digital networks of activists, urging people to flood the streets of Lower Manhattan. The terms were unspecific, but the call to action tapped into popular perceptions of a political system controlled by corporate money. My first reaction was, great, great, but my, I was also like, Saturday? Wall Street's closed. Why do this on a Saturday? You know, we need to do it when people, uh, when they're actually working. If we're stuck with a Saturday day, the only way that we could have any effect on, you know, even be seen by people in Wall Street was to still be there two days later. So we were sort of handed the idea of a camp. The group had set its eyes on occupying Chase Manhattan Plaza, the former headquarters of J.P. Morgan Chase Bank near Wall Street. But when the march set out on the morning of September the 17th, they were met by a heavy police presence. But there was another space, a few blocks north of Wall Street, that was still relatively free of security. In the early afternoon of September the 17th, texts went out to a larger network of supporters to gather at Zuccotti Park. I showed up at the same time as people were coming in, and there were a lot of people. Just people sat down in groups, frankly, I think 20, 30, and they were talking, having conversations. It seemed like mini general assemblies. So could you please join us and take a seat? 
that was kind of like my whole entry point was really like when we just broke out into working groups and it just automatically like the wheels started turning. That was kind of, that was amazing for me. By nightfall, over a thousand people had flooded into Zuccotti. And what really excited me about this is that it was a critique on Wall Street as a critique on uh, economic injustice and a critique on the relationship between state and private uh, corporations and how it's such an inappropriate relationship. That night, on the main steps of the park, Occupy Wall Street held its first General Assembly. Those present decided they were there to stay. So that night I said, I have to stay here. Like, there's no way that I'm like, gonna go home and say, did they get kicked out? Like, what happened? No. It is a form of direct action. What you're essentially saying is, well, this is a public space. We are the public. The public should not have to ask permission to occupy their own space. We're going to do it. It was an occupation that was to spark one of the biggest social movements in the US since the Vietnam War. And it was really exciting because I think people had no, you know, it was like, wow, look at what's really going on here. And I think everybody was in awe. You know, no one really expected this to last more than a day or two or three. You didn't have time to think about it. To me, it was about, um, you were there, how do you keep people there? It was the, always the question was, how do you keep people there? Because the moment that you can keep people there is the moment that they begin believing. Activists sought to build a movement that reflected a new society they wished to see. Occupy Wall Street based itself on direct democracy, a process of consensus decision-making with no hierarchy. The first symbol, the first symbol, the first symbol is this, is this. Hand signals and the people's mic became standard ways of communicating to help hear each other's voices. How do you engage people? How do you just keep people? How do you facilitate the self-empowerment, right? It's not, you don't empower people. How can you facilitate that self-empowerment? Anybody could join or start a working group. Groups formed to address a range of issues like how to challenge race and gender bias within the movement, or simply how to provide food to those sleeping in the park. And these ways of organizing are really rooted in, in many ways in anarchist practice of understanding um, the importance of direct democracy, understanding the importance of direct action to actually make the change, the process of collective liberation that no one is free until we are all free, um, mutual aid, my struggle and what I need is interdependent with you. At times, thousands of people would turn up for general assemblies in Zuccotti, spending hours to reach consensus on decisions affecting the entire group. If you're going to join Occupy, you have to get on board with horizontal decision making. And in my mind, it's the reason why this thing has grown so much, is that actually its structure is what allows it to be something that's fairly inclusive. I think the power of our movement has been precisely to create that space of autonomy uh, and to tell the political structure, essentially, it's up to you guys to prove to us that you are our legitimate representatives. Because at the moment, nobody in America really sees you as our legitimate representatives. We see you as representatives of big money. And now for a story that made us say, seriously? But as its yeah, momentum grew, politicians and the mainstream media berated Occupy Wall Street for having no clear goals. Well, a protest without an objective is like a party of a picnic of the unemployed and the indolent. Yes. They just wander around. They're, they're they, not, look, so all of these yes, people, all they have people, to do is take a shower and they can get a job if they went to college. <laughs> Seriously. When we go to East New York and reoccupy a home that's been foreclosed on, that's a demand, right? That's a very clear demand. Like, we demand people have housing. The point is that Occupy Wall Street made no demands of politicians. The idea to operate outside a political system that they saw as inherently flawed, bought by special interest groups, and whose leadership most people had lost faith in. We're not going to make demands of the political order which we feel to be inherently corrupt. On the other hand, direct action, rather than appealing to people in authority to behave differently, the ideal is that you act as if they don't exist at all. And so when you reoccupy a home, it's like, look, People need homes, we're not going to demand it. We are going to demand it, we're also just going to do it. 
the rise of Occupy Wall Street reflected an increasing frustration with those in charge. A downward spiral set off by the bursting of the housing bubble had led to a financial crisis not seen in the US for generations. People are losing their homes at a, like, a very frequent rate. The rich keep getting richer and nobody's blaming you know, nobody's blaming these folks. Like, nobody is investigating the banks. Nobody is going into that. And what we've had in the U.S. is almost incredibly selfish and vindictive move on the part of the people who are already in the strongest position, essentially to grab all the remaining cookies as the whole structure collapses. A government bailout allowed the banks to stay afloat while thousands of Americans faced record levels of unemployment, financial debt, and foreclosures. By summer 2011, political leaders were fighting over a massive deficit and saying nothing about the sharp economic divide that had taken a hold of the country. The top 1% of America now owned 40% of the wealth. The sentiment that only the wealthiest had any representation had grown. We are the 99% became a key slogan of OWS. Under this unifying banner, Zuccotti became a magnetic space, drawing people from all over the country. And I think that people were finally realizing this class struggle and actually seeing that this is, you know, that class warfare is going on in this country. And people were really eager for that change. And the person who had promised change had done little to fulfill it. Thank you very much, everybody. I never voted in American elections, even though I have an American passport, because it didn't make sense to me, except for Obama, because everything that he said made sense. And that day, I said, "Wow, we're gonna, we're gonna get a lot. Like this is gonna be the, the, the answer, and this is the, the hope and change we wanted. We're actually going to see this country change." But he didn't do it. So many young people came into politics because they were inspired by Obama, who ran you know, explicitly appealing to young people. His platform was one of change. Um, we had a population so angry at Wall Street that they were basically ready to accept almost anything. If you can't manage to enact progressive legislation of any kind in that circumstance, let's face it, you're never going to be able to do it through electoral means. And we didn't. In a matter of weeks, Occupy had spread across the country. Encampments had taken hold in hundreds of towns and cities. How do you fix the deficit? Many organizing around issues specific to their community. Notice it happening in the, in the centers, in the city centers, which was important and good and to see that this was, that was gonna build steam. Uh, but what made this different was the fact that it did take root in those small communities, in those rural communities, and in places where you never expected it to take root. We're seeing streams from places like Bellingham, Washington, and these, you know, in, in middle of New Orleans, places where there's 15 people that are participating in it. But the, this, is, this is their way of connecting, feeling connected to it in a lot of ways as well. Technology allowed Occupy groups and individual protesters to coordinate actions, learn from each other, and record everything. Gives people a window into the movement, people who may have heard about it, not really understood it, and wanted to understand it better, and they went searching and they found these live feeds. With mainstream US media either ignoring or attacking the movement, Occupy Wall Street was able to create its own coverage. Makeshift media teams were formed to broadcast live video feeds of actions around the country. We needed a way to cover the story that wasn't being covered by the mainstream media. I think for the people who started doing the live stream first, the live feeds, it was never about journalism, it was more about just making sure people could see what was happening. Almost every action and arrest was captured on a smartphone or camera and then broadcast over the internet, often turning viral. It literally took white girls getting pepper sprayed in the face for people to be interested. That's when actually our media blackouts kind of stopped. Two people just standing there, you already have them penned in, and then you spray them so closely in the face. How they feel they can get away with things and that, that level of violence that they're accustomed to and that they exert is so, that it's, it's just like, 
it just kind of outraged folks. Many Americans were shocked to see police using pepper spray so casually against protesters. These sorts of abuses, including this incident at a university in California, made headlines around the country. What we found is that having the live stream allows nothing to be hidden, um, and it helps to shape the narrative. On October the 1st, the NYPD arrested 700 protesters on Brooklyn Bridge. They made it almost impossible for any vehicular traffic to pass. The largest mass arrests New York had seen in decades. Police say they warned the protesters not to disrupt traffic. Bridge! 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 Those anti-Wall Street protesters are staying put. This new attention and the heavy-handed police response brought even more people out in support of the movement, including unions and longtime community organizers. On October the 15th, tens of thousands of people marched on Times Square. In just four short weeks, Occupy Wall Street had mobilized Americans across the spectrum to demand change. And what's happening is that people are coming back to life, right? They're coming alive again in this moment. And, you know, and they're feeling that energy. And it's really, this is the process of transformation that's critical for social change, is when people access their power, begin to taste what it really is like to be alive and that energy. Once you feel that, you can never, you, you very rarely turn back, you know? And so that's what we're seeing. I need you to clear the street. Just clear the street. You can stand on the sidewalk. I just need you out of the street. But that energy was not to go unchallenged. On the other side of the United States, in California, in the early morning hours of October the 25th, police in riot gear surrounded the Occupy Oakland camp. The following 24 hours saw over 100 arrested as thousands faced off against the police. Tear gas and flash grenades were used. That night, Iraq war veteran Scott Olson was severely wounded. Videos of the violent crackdown were broadcast around the world. What happened? What happened? He got hit. Oh, he got shot. In the US, the fact that a young white male who'd fought for his country was now fighting for his life cast further light on police brutality in minority communities in cities like Oakland. If it hadn't been caught on video and if it was someone black, we wouldn't have even known about it. I'd be trying to tell people about it and they'd only halfway believe me. On November the 10th, a conference call took place between at least a dozen different police chiefs of various cities. The exact details of that call are still unclear, but it's known that dealing with the Occupy camps was a part of the discussion. Many in the movement felt this was part of a national coordinated effort to break Occupy Wall Street. It was pretty clear that there was a conspiracy by government agencies and, and elected officials to move people out of spaces and to move real people power, to dislocate real people power. In the days that followed, occupations in numerous cities were evicted, including Portland, Seattle, and Denver. That's when the trouble began. This time, US media outlets, both local and national, were present. Those clashes closed Broadway as to witness the police employing overwhelming force against the protesters. And then, at midnight on November the 15th, police in riot gear started surrounding the place where everything began. Looks like it's going down. I just got out of the shower, I was about to go to bed. When I got the, when I got the text message, like there's this Occupy text alert system, and it said, come to Zuccotti right now, eviction in process. All persons must temporarily leave the park. Okay, I'm here filming. I'm filming, I have DCPD press passes. Let's go. Relax, 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 relax. I was going, relax, take care. Relax. After preventing journalists from reaching the scene, Police using batons and pepper spray started clearing the area. Oh, 
Occupy supporters rushed into Lower Manhattan to defend the park. But police had blocked off every entrance. And all of a sudden, it's just pepper spray. They just pepper. We already pushed back as far as possible, and they just pepper sprayed everyone. The first thing I see is two of my good friends, Nalini and Nicole, in tears. Their eyes are bloodshot red, and they're just like all over the place because they have been pepper sprayed. As soon as we're there, literally within minutes, there are cops starting to surround us. And I said, this is, they want us gone. Like, they want any presence, any, they want to smash the entire, like, not just the movement, but the people. And smash our hopes and smash everything. In a matter of hours, Zuccotti had been cleared of any sign of Occupy Wall Street. But if clearing Zuccotti Park was meant to kill Occupy Wall Street, it didn't go as planned. Just two days later, on November the 17th, Tens of thousands of people took to the streets of New York. Hundreds of activists are marching across the city, pledging to occupy streets, bridges, and the subway. We are A day of action to shut down the stock exchange. This is a and take over the streets of the city. Occupy Wall Street event. While they were unable to stop the opening trade belt. The other side. The sheer number of people that flooded Lower Manhattan that morning and through the rest of the day signaled that Occupy Wall Street was far from over. Thousands of people came. We successfully created human barricades on every point of access into the Wall Street area at different moments of time, using affinity groups in many of these situations, using a spokes council model, using direct action training. And it was again a moment of like, wow, look at what we can do. The people were determined to show that the Occupy Wall Street movement was about much more than occupying a park or a plaza. The movement has created a space within the American consciousness to believe in a different type of political power. One controlled not by politicians or corporate money, but by people taking action with the hope of transforming a country they think is in dire need of change. The truth is, is that the national debate has changed, the global debate about economic finance, you know, capitalism, has changed and broken up to a new level. I think that the reality is that most people see the system as flawed and messed up, but usually people didn't think they could do anything about it. People who have never imagined themselves out in the streets or part of a movement see themselves as part of this movement. Um, it's like there's no way to put the genie back in the box right now. And now people think they can do something about it.